to uh, Pastor Tim and Don for the, uh, the opportunity to speak this morning. Um, wherever Pastor Tim is, hopefully he's, he's having fun and enjoying himself and he's, he's not a foot deep in snow. Yeah, yeah, but he will be soon enough. He will be, yeah. So, <coughs> I kind of feel like we need to do something with God this morning here, hey? Kind of feels like something needs to be broke off a little bit, maybe. Kind of feeling like we're going to go there pretty quick. Okay, if you don't know me, I'll introduce myself. I'll start by saying my tears come fairly easily, as you can probably just tell I just swallowed them down there for a second. But if you don't know who we are, this is Rebecca. She's my wife. My name's Ryan. Um, I grew up here, went away for a long time, came back. It's great to be back. Um, yeah, so it's a bit interesting. You know, I'm a wanderer, just so you know, but I said Jay made me stay in this white zone here, so. Um, it's interesting to be back because it was never kind of part of the plan, you know, but sometimes God puts stuff in front of you that isn't really part of the plan, you know. So being part of the, and many of you have heard this before, being part of kind of the, the first set of families that kind of started the river to be a number of years later standing up here speaking at the river, it's a, uh, Let's just say it's a bit of a process. But today I want to talk about the idea of the battle already being won. So we'll work through some stuff. You know, I'm going to do it a bit different. I told Jed he's off the hook today. There's, no, there's nothing up there, so we can just follow in our Bibles. I'm going to jump around a little bit, but we're going to talk about, um, if you want to find in your, in your Bible, uh, 1 Samuel 17. We're going to work through the story of uh, David and Goliath. Now I know there's, there's a lot in there, so we're going to jump around, so bear with me. Um, many of you know the story, are very familiar with it, but hopefully we'll, we'll have a couple side notes in there once in a while that, that, land with, that land with you. So let's pray before we get started. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, God. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are with us this morning that you're with those that couldn't be here. God, we just pray that you would be with us, that we would have ears to hear, eyes to see, hearts to receive this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're kind of gonna, gonna start and we'll work our way into it a little bit. So one of my big things, so many, many of you probably know, but um, so what I do is work as a psychologist. So I only say that this morning from the point of view of some of the things that I say will come through that filter, right? So, um, you know, that's kind of how I view the world through that lens um, to a certain extent. Um, but just so you know, right, it's kind of just to build a bit of context from, from kind of where I come from from time to time. So. Saying that to say one of the things that I really believe deeply is living with intention, right? I, I, I talk to a lot of people, and I won't say just guys, but, you know, I've kind of got a, got a heart for guys, and one of the things guys really struggle with is that purpose. And what's my purpose? Where am I going? Why am I here? So the intentionality behind that. So without priorities and intentions, okay? So I, I'll just, I said I'll jump around a bit, but so something I'm really serious about is priorities and intentions because without understanding priorities, we cannot determine intent. Without intent, it becomes difficult to live in a meaningful way. Living in a meaningful way means that we need to have a God-given vision for our future, and this is kind of what we've been talking about, having that kingdom mindset, right? So, we've, we've kind of, you know, it goes without saying, we all have this 
vision, right? We all have a purpose, right? We've, we've heard this before, but the thing is, sometimes we find it difficult to know what that is and what that looks like, okay? So sometimes it's difficult to see because of our circumstances, because of our upbringing, because of our past experiences. In other words, sometimes we're unable to see or even believe that we have a God-given vision because our focus is on the giants instead of our God. So, like I said, talking about giants, we automatically talk about David, or think about David and Goliath. So let's paint a bit of a picture and kind of get into it. So this is a battle, as many of you know, between the Philistines and the Israelites, the Israelites led by King Saul. So we have David on one side, and like I said, bear with me, I'll jump around. We've got David on one side, he's a shepherd boy, he's the youngest of eight sons. What's really interesting, obviously we take into consideration cultural context. So when he's fighting Goliath, he's, you know, many say about 13, 14, maybe 15 years old, in the natural, not fit for battle. He's a musician. He was a lunch boy who took his brother some food on the front lines of battle. And on the other side, we have Goliath. He's part of the Philistine army. The Bible says that he was their hero, um, kind of like 10 feet tall, wearing 125 pounds of armor. So the Bible tells us that for 40 days, Goliath would come out and he would taunt two times a day, morning and evening. He strutted his stuff and he's like, I'm here. What are you guys going to do about it? Right? So maybe this is something that we can relate to. Perhaps your giants are the first thought you wake up to or the last thought you have at night. Perhaps your giants infiltrate your thoughts throughout your day, steal your joy at any opportunity. Perhaps his voice is all too familiar and his walk is all too recognizable. Perhaps your giants permeate all your senses. So just like us, when we face a battle, David never really, in the natural, belonged on that battlefield. But when he entered the battlefield that day, something happened. David was thrust into being one of the most influential biblical figures that we talk about throughout history. Unknowingly, David had been prepared by God for years just for this moment in time. See, as a shepherd, David didn't merely feed and lead his father's sheep. Obviously, you know, a shepherd wasn't the most glamorous position at the time and maybe seemed a bit inconsequential, but it had its dangers. You know, the Bible tells us that David, David killed bears and lions to defend his father's sheep. In fact, we'll talk about this in a second, but he used these experiences to convince Saul that he should be the one to defeat Goliath. And he said this in 1 Samuel 17, 34 to 37, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went out after it, struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned to me, I seized it by its hair, struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and the bear. The uncircumcised Philistine will be one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. All right, so side note. Well, so I said, I, I, I'll keep warming. I'm going to jump around a bit. But so... We'll talk a bit about this, but I don't want to make it a big point. So when David said, like, okay, I'm the one that wants to, wants to fight Goliath. So he had to go to Saul, and he had to kind of convince Saul that he was the dude to do this, right? So he's in front of Saul saying, hey, and I'll, I'll talk about this in a second, but he's like, hey, I think I'm the guy to take care of this. Nobody else is dealing with this. I'm going to take care of this. And Saul's like, mm, I'm not sure. But David's like, yeah, I, I, think, I think I'm the guy. So finally Saul, Saul agrees. Now here's what happens. And this, this is a side note, but I think it's pretty important. So Saul takes his armor. And he's like, okay, here you go. I'm going to take my armor and I'm going to put it on you. Because this is what I think I'm supposed to do. You need to be protected. So I'm going to take what I got I'm going to put it on you. 
So now we have David. He's got Saul's stuff on. And he's like, okay, here we go. Clunk, clunk. And he's going, hold on a second. This doesn't fit. This doesn't fit. Now, the intention of Saul was to protect him. So the intention was good. The intention was there. But Saul didn't realize, or better put, maybe better put, Saul's armor did not fit David. David was a shepherd who used his hands and used a sling. This is where David was comfortable. This is where David was called. David knew the value of what he had in his hand. He didn't need Saul's gear because he knew the value of what he had, okay? A sling can inflict more force from a distance. Okay, so here we go. If it came down with Goliath to a battle of strength, David knew he had no chance. If it came back down to a one-on-one -on -one battle where David had to rush Goliath, if he had to step into the zone where David's spear or sword, or Goliath's spear or sword could get him, David had no chance. But what was in David's hand was valuable, and he knew that. God had trained and perfected David's ability to use a sling from a distance. And here's the point I'm trying to make. So what's in your hand that you can use? See, oftentimes we undervalue what's in our hands. Oftentimes we're looking for somebody else's stuff. We're looking to be equipped by somebody else. We're looking to get under some kind of teaching that's going to fill us. We're going to, we're like, I need that. I need what they've got. I need what he's got. And God's saying, what's in your hand? What have I prepared? What have I prepared you with? What tools, skills, and abilities have I given you that helps you to step into your battle? Because your battle is not going to be won by somebody else. Saul, Saul did not defeat Goliath. Saul was not the one that said, hey, you know what? Someone needs to step up. I'm going to do that. No, Saul said, and I'm being careful, and, but Saul was like, okay, you want to go? Here. Take my stuff and go. Now, I get it. I get it, right? We, we, we need people around us. We need equipping. We need fellowship. We need all that stuff. We need Jed's noodles once in a while. But you don't need someone else's sword. You don't need someone else's shield. You need the breastplate that God's given you. You need the shoes that God's given you. You need the armor that God's given you. Because that's what he's equipped you to do. All right. We, we landed. We got there. All right. So painting a bit of a picture. So we got the Israelites on one side, the Philistines on the other side. They're on opposing hills. Goliath comes out, he taunts the Israelites, challenges them, and he wants to go one-on-one. -on -one. And like I said, you know, this ain't going to happen. Nobody wants to take him up on the offer. Enter David. Da, da, da. So at the, request, at the request of Jesse, who's David's father, David went to the Israelite camp to bring food to his brothers to check on how they're doing. So Jesse's like, hey, the sheep are okay. You can check out with them for a while. Go check on your brothers. And while you're out of here, take some food. See how they're doing. So David gets there. He's chatting to people. He's like, hey, what's going on? He brings the food. And he hears something. And he hears Goliath, right? Goliath has been taunting. So as I said earlier, in the natural, David didn't belong on the battlefield. But what he didn't know was that in the spirit, David, David was being perfectly placed to step into the God-given vision and plan for his life in that moment. David was being obedient to that step that was in front of him. If he would not have agreed to take his brother some food, history would look very different. Taking his brother's food in that moment looked pretty inconsequential. In that word. Yeah. 
It didn't look very important, did it? It didn't look very important. So let me ask you a question. What's God asking you to do today that doesn't look very important? What's God asking you to do today that doesn't look very important? This is something I think as Christians we wrestle with quite a bit because we want the big booming something. We want the big stage. We want the big song. We want the big song and dance. We want the big spear. Look at my spear. I have a big one. Thump, thump, thump. What about changing someone's tires? What about taking someone a meal? What about changing someone's oil? What about praying for someone? What about just kind of taking a step towards someone? Hey, how about you come to the agape meal on, in December? Seems pretty inconsequential. Can't even say it. I'm not going to try once more. I just thought I'd try one more time. Doesn't seem very important, does it? Because <laughs> here's the deal. Goliath wasn't just taunting the Israelites. He was defying God on God's own turf. Every day, Israel declined Goliath's challenge, so for 40 days, they perhaps were subconsciously conceding a belief that their God was no match for the gods of the Philistines. Yikes. So here we go. David wasn't going to let this go on any longer. After convincing Saul, like I said, he had to go to Saul and say, hey, I think I'm the dude to do this. After convincing Saul to let him challenge Goliath, David chose five stones and went out to meet him. We'll talk about that in a second. Goliath mocked him and cursed him, and then David famously replied, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistines the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals and the whole world will know there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves for the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. There's a lot there, okay? So at this point, no physical battle had taken place yet. So what does this mean? David's words were shaping his vision and his future. David was speaking where he was going. David, David's words build faith and allowed him to step boldly and see what others could not see. Everyone around David was focused on the giants, their circumstances, while David was focused on the victory that had already been won. David was simply being obedient to align himself with the God-given vision that had been building on the inside of him. So I'll ask you another question. What's God been asking you to do? What has he placed inside of you that makes you excited? If you could do that one thing, what would that be? I like asking people what that one thing is or what makes them come alive. And then I like hearing them say, oh, I don't know. Because most people, when you ask them that, say, I don't know. And I argue, but you do know. See, the reality is, is most people know what they're supposed to do. Most people know the gifts, the talents, the skills that God has placed inside of you. Most people know what that is. Most people can articulate what that is, what those are. Where people get stuck, oftentimes what I find is that they don't know how to apply that, which is a really interesting process and beyond the scope of where we're going today. But when I talk to people, it's like, what makes you come alive? What gets you excited? What skills, talents, and abilities do you have inside of you that you believe God has placed there? That they can answer. And then when I say, well, what are you going to do with that? Then they go, I don't know. Because all of a sudden it becomes this pressure thing that I need to perform. I need to do something. It's like, okay, let's take some pressure off. What do you think God would have you do? And then you sit with that for a second. And then the I don't know becomes a bit, I don't, well, well may, maybe this. Well, what about that? Tell me about that. 
well, maybe this. Well, what's that? Tell me about that. And all of a sudden, we start to get a bit of a vision of some of the stuff God has placed inside of us. And our skills and abilities and the talents that we have, all of a sudden, we're going, wait a minute. I can do that. I can step into that. I can do that thing. What skills, talents, abilities has God placed inside you that come to life when you're using them for his purposes? See, I, I, I don't talk about this very often. Those of you that know me know I don't really like talking about myself at all. Um, but, yeah, see? <laughs> but... When I was several years younger, I, I had a vision that I had no idea what it meant, right? I, I was a sports guy, that's what I did, okay? So I, hockey, ball, you name it, I played it. But then at the end of that, it was like, now what, what do I do with this? So when I was young, I said, well, I don't know what I'm gonna do, but you know, if I do anything, I'll become a psychologist. Well, when you're a teenager in your early 20s and you say, I'm going to be a psychologist and have no idea what that means or what it's going to take to get there or the tears and the sweat and the battle, and the battle, And the battle. <clears throat> I know. And I know when I stand here, I'm not the world's best preacher. But I don't care. Because I got something to give. Just like each one of you has something to give. I'll spare you years of that process. But there were plenty of times over the last couple of years, the last few years, that I could have said, I'm done. I could have bowed out. I could have said, no, this is too tough. This is too difficult. I don't want to do this. And I think some of you might be there today. See, without Rebecca, without the girls, without my parents, without those around us, I wouldn't be able to stand here with the conviction that I have and say, you can do it. And those aren't just words. That's from here. I believe you can do it. You can overcome, you can take that next step, you can step into, you can grab that big, shiny, nice javelin that's yours, that God gave you, that Saul didn't give you, that God gave you, that he placed you in these shoes for today to step into over and above. You can get through. Sometimes it's a question about when. Sometimes it's a question about when. Sometimes it's a question about what does that look like but it's never a question about if. So, David spoke truth over his situation. He spoke the truth of God despite doubt and fear in those around him. This does not mean the process is easy, but check this out. So as the Philistine, as Goliath moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly towards the battle line. We'll talk about that in a second. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into the forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. Now this is where I think, and any of you who've read the story pull different things out of it, but for me this is probably one of the coolest points in the story. David killed Goliath with a single stone. 
All it took was one stone to take down the giant. Once David made the decision to engage with what God had placed inside of him, the natural battle was easily won. Why? Because David had been diligent and obedient to the preparation God had put him through that led to this moment in his life. <sighs> See, here's the thing. We often want the result, we want the miracle, we want the breakthrough without the process. Often the process is challenging, the process is difficult, the process is costly, the process is time consuming. David had been prepared for this day. His process had, his process had han happened out in the fields where no one was watching. He had no audience. He had no cheerleaders. No one was applauding when he killed the bear or the lion with his bare hands. We could say that God was his biggest challenger and his biggest champion. David's preparation made him ready for this moment. When the moment arose, David did not hesitate. I said we'd talk about this in a second. So as we see in chapter 48, or verse 48, as Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. And I think this today is kind of, you know, my biggest challenge to you guys is what giants do we need to quickly move towards? What are you facing today? that you know you're equipped for. You know you're equipped for. God's been preparing you and he's asking you to quickly move, move towards. What fear, what fear do you need to overcome? How long has it been since you ran directly toward what God has asked you to do? We can find all kinds of reasons. The Bible's full of reasons. Moses ran from justice, Jonah ran from God, or we might say swam from God. Rahab ran a brothel, Samson ran to the wrong woman, Jacob ran in circles, Sarah ran out of belief she could have a child, Elijah ran to the mountains, Lot ran with the wrong crowd, but at the end of the day, God used them all, each one of them. So maybe today is your day to quickly rush towards your giant. Maybe today's the day where you take that step. Maybe today's the day when you find your stones and load your, sl your sling. Regardless of what you might be facing, the battle has already been won. Someone today, I think, needs to hear this. You have a choice. You have a choice. Maybe today's the day you engage, you choose to engage with your partner. Maybe today's the day you re-engage with your children. You choose to love God again. You choose to trust God again. Maybe today is the day you choose to forgive. So the obvious plot in this story is David versus Goliath. But a cool subplot is a God focus versus giant focus. So I'll ask you today, where is your focus? I spoke earlier about intentionality. David was intentional about seeing what others could not see. But here's the thing. He also refused to see what everybody else was seeing. All the eyes of the Israel, Israeli army fell on the size of the Philistines in front of them. They chose to look at their short-term giant circumstances. But David, although clearly seeing Goliath, simply chose to see God more. David seen himself as being part of God's army. In fact, David was convinced the army of God was with him, and he believed that the gates of hell would not prevail. You see, David's focus was never solely on Goliath. Rather, his desire was to glorify God through his intense belief that the Philistines were defying the armies of the living God. David firmly believed that the Lord would deliver that day not only Goliath, but the entire Philistine army into his hands. Why? So that all the earth would know that there's a God in Israel. By taking that one step that day, the entire situation changed. One stone changed the course of history. 
So the story goes on to say that once David defeated Goliath, the rest of the Israeli army grew in faith and stepped into boldness, the boldness displayed by David. It says here that the Phil- when the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, what did they do? They turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines. They pursued them to the entrance of Gath and the gates of Ekron. The dead were strewn along the road to Gath and Ekron. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. See, here's the part as Christians that we kind of forget a little bit. Oh, they plundered their camp. Oh, that's not very nice. Well, how about we look at it from the other perspective? They were having a party. They were like, we just defeated these guys. Let's party. Let's get excited about this. Like, okay, I'll, I'll go there in a second. But they plundered their camp. Well, yeah, we read that like, oh, they stole all their stuff. No, God gave them all their stuff. He's like, right on, guys. This is what I called you to do. Let's go party. Let's get excited about this. So, why is it important? Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines. So why is it important to live out the God vision or calling on our lives? Because our bold step in faith has the potential to release others into theirs. And again, this is ties into something I'm really passionate about. And like I said, in my process, in our process, I had opportunities to say no. I had opportunities to say this is enough. Could have done that. Didn't do it. It was really difficult. It was difficult to say yes. It would have been a lot easier to say no. Because it was tough. You know one reason, I'm not trying to be funny, you know one reason why a lot, some people, find it difficult to do what God has called you to do? Because it's tough. Because there's a cost. It's called obedience. There's sacrifice to doing what God has called you to do. And I'm not saying that people aren't obedient or that they aren't willing to sacrifice, but it's difficult, and circumstances come up. Things happen, life happens. But maybe today's the day when you decide to take that one step. Maybe you need to experience today a healing touch of God. Maybe God's asking you to do something today, or for a while, that you know is the direction you're supposed to go. But it's tough. One thing I, when I work with people, one thing, and I'll keep this brief, one, there's, there's themes that you recognize when you work with people. And I'm just going to be completely honest. One of those themes is forgiveness. One of those themes in working with people and the challenges that people go through is forgiveness. I hear all the time, I just want to get over this. Why can't I just forget about this? Why can't I just move on? All right, I'll take everything and I'll I'll try to keep it short, okay? So, when we talk about forgiveness, this is not optional. The Bible doesn't say, hey, might be a good idea to forgive somebody. Things might be better for you. You know, it's just a suggestion, but you might want to do this. There's about 14,000 scriptures, not that many, that command us to forgive. This is not an optional. If we've invited Jesus into our hearts and we want to live according to the Bible, as Christians, in our walk, forgiveness is not an option. It's not an optional choice. We just got to look at the Lord's Prayer. 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Forgiveness is not a suggestion. It is something we receive and then are commanded to offer to others. I know, it's tough. So, okay, illustration time. <coughs> so, and this is where, excuse me, this is where my, what I do comes into play. Okay, Jay, I'll try stay. This this will be birth right here, okay, this white line. Okay, but here's, here's really, really, really quickly. We're born. We have everything in front of us. This is exciting. We start walking along. We start living. We start doing life. And then something happens. And we're doing it. We're doing life. And then something happens. And then something happens. An event, a circumstance. Somebody says something. Somebody does something. We experience something in our life. And all of a sudden, life is happening backwards. And we get focused on this. And I don't know if this speaks to somebody today, but I'm going to go there. Something happens. Something has happened. I don't know what it is. Maybe God's speaking to you right now. And we get so focused and life still happens. And it goes by and it goes by and it goes by until at some point God says, hold on a minute. And this gets highlighted. Those words get highlighted. Those circumstances get highlighted. That event gets highlighted. And we have a choice to make at this moment. Are we going to deal with that? Because what that means oftentimes is stepping back into our circumstance. And what do we do with that? Oftentimes, it's forgiveness. Now, I'm not saying everybody does this, but enough people that we don't deal with it at the time and we're doing life in reverse until we get to this point where God says enough is enough. You're gonna make a choice. You're either going to keep walking in reverse and you're gonna be focused on that or we're gonna deal with it. And now this is where, I'm, this is a big thing. I get that. But we're gonna make that choice because if we don't forgive, it gets real difficult to see what's up here. It gets real difficult to see what's up here. And one of the most, what really, personally, what really weighs on me is watching somebody walk through life that has something that they need to deal with that, how can I word this really carefully? Because I don't want to ever imply that everybody's walking around with unforgiveness. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is oftentimes there's something that we can go to where that needs to happen, okay? So just here, but what weighs on me is like watching people with so much potential and they're just, they're weighed down when all you gotta do is make a choice so that you can see, you can turn. Put yourself in a position to turn and see what's in front of you. So, yeah, okay, let me read you this. Restoration requires a look at the past but is near impossible if we're unable to see the future. We can never change what we've done or the hurt or disappointment we have had. When something has been taken from you, it can be very painful. Restoration requires a future focus, otherwise we can get stuck. 
which means we can remain in bondage from that which we have been through. We can never have what has already been. We are no longer that person in that place or in the same set of circumstances. 1 Peter 5.10 says this, And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Restoration becomes possible when we're able to look at our past from the perspective of the possibility of moving forward. Restoration is a future-based action. Okay, so maybe this speaks to you today. Maybe something happened. Maybe there's something back here. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to make it a big thing. But here's what I can tell you. When you choose to heal yourself, you heal your bloodline. How you allow God to work in you and through you will impact the choices and decisions that you make. The choices and decisions that you make today in turn directly impact your future generations. I know, it's heavy. That's a big one. But this is the thing. And this is, this is I know this isn't a, 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 an easy way to think about life. But the choices and decisions that we make today are going to impact our children and they're going to impact their children. I know that's tough to sit with sometimes because of some of the choices that we have made and decisions we have made. That's okay. Hello, grace of God. None of us would be sitting here without the grace of God. But the intentionality of the choices and decisions that we make need to be front of mind because it's so important to step into, to step into so that our children can see that they can step into, so that they can step into, so that they can teach their children to step into and to step into. See, God won't call you without equipping you. God anoints and equips the unqualified. Sometimes we can get confused between God's voice and what we think might be the enemy. David chose clearly. David was clearly chosen to defeat Goliath. But here's the thing. He also could have thought that the enemy was setting him up for defeat. Wow, wow, wow. But David had the equipping of God on the inside of him to be able to distinguish his voice. So what is God saying to you today? It's, I'm not that complicated. You can tell by this message, I'm not that complicated. Like life is not that difficult. It can be difficult. We all have circumstances. We all have stuff that happens. We've all been through stuff. But life in and of itself is not that difficult. See, God's voice equals peace. The enemy brings fear. Sorry, that, that's kind of it. See, but then what happens is when we get scared, now we got the anxiety. Now we got the depression. Now we got the what ifs. I should have, I could have, why didn't I? Now it gets difficult. But if we know that it's the enemy that's speaking, we can step into God's voice, which brings the peace of God and say, hold on a minute. I know you're trying, bugger off. Now all of a sudden things get simple again because that allows us to step into and step into nah, 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 and step into. I know that process is not that easy. And I can stand here and I'm going to finish in a second. And I can stand here. This is not just lip service. I know what it's like to lay in bed with the 
sweat pouring down your forehead and the fear on the inside of you and you're gripping the bed and you're like, God, where are you? Where have you gone? Because I'm not feeling you right now. I'm not hearing you right now. I'm scared to be up in the middle of the night pacing the floor going, what the heck is going on? Why am I feeling like this? So I say that to say it's not just lip service. And I know I'm speaking to somebody. I know that that fear grips you and you don't know what to do with it. The peace of God is on the other side of that. And I fought for months. (laughs) And it was a fight, just like some of you got to go through. And that's what makes life difficult. Life is not difficult. The circumstances of life are difficult. But the presence of God, but the presence of God, but the presence of God His yoke is easy. His burden is light. I don't know what you go through. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know where you've been. And I might be talking to one person, and that's okay. If you're that one person, oh, that's nice. just finish with a couple thoughts here. Why is it so important to deal with your issues quickly? Because bitterness develops over time. Bitterness becomes a root of anger and resentment. A root needs time to develop. A seed does not have a root unless it's been watered and given time to develop. Maybe there's somebody here today that that speaks to. I'm going to read. We'll we'll finish up with this, but I'm just going to read this because it's straight out of a book. It's a quote. See, sometimes as, as individuals and as a church, as Christians, we kind of get on the back foot. We kind of get more focused on our circumstances, on our giants, than the victory that's already been won. God is saying that all the powers of hell combined are no match for the onslaught of the church. Understand that God is not saying we are holding out against the onslaught of hell. Hell is unable to defend itself against the onslaught of the church. This picture is very different to the perception most of us have had. We sometimes feel that we are holding out against the enemy, we're holding out against the attack of the enemy. We often hear it said that we are under attack. But Jesus declared, this is not how it's meant to be. We are the invaders. The defenses of hell are powerless against the might of the church. See, sometimes we can get so caught up in fighting our perceived battles that we lose sight of the fact that the battle has already been won. As Christians, as the church, we're on the offense. The enemy is on the defense. Not every situation requires casting out demons or rebuking the enemy. Not every situation requires casting out demons or rebuking the enemy. Sometimes we just need to invite Jesus into our situations, into our circumstances, and give him the glory and the opportunity to work things out. Thank you, Jesus. If you need prayer today, 
There'll be a couple people up here that can pray for you. I know we're going to eat. It's snowing outside. You've got an extra five minutes. Can you come up and can we sing I Speak Jesus? Is that okay? You guys okay with that? You can hang out for five more minutes before we eat. If there's something in today that spoke to you, if there's something in today that you need to grab onto, I encourage you to do that. If you need some prayer, I can be up here. There'll be a couple other people. But just before we go into that song, we're just going to pray. When we seek God's blessing as his ultimate value in our life, we are throwing ourselves entirely into the river of his will and power and purposes for us. All our other needs become secondary to what we really want, which is to become wholly immersed in what God is trying to do in us, through us, and around us for his glory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, that you are with us, that you are working in us. Thank you, God, that if there is somebody that needed your word today, that you would just touch them. In Jesus' name, we give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the thanks. And bless the food that we're going to eat later. Amen. Why don't you stand with us? Mm -hmm.